If you can get seated quickly, Tony's going to come and, and open with something very special today for the veterans. So if you all would give Tony Moore a great big welcome. Oh, that one? I can do one. What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I know. That's why we don't have nice things. We're getting them, though. We're getting them. So, uh, we're in the back talking, praying. And one thing that was mentioned uh, in our prayer was uh, God. Softening hearts and hardening hearts. Now, when I read Ezekiel, he tells me that uh, I've replaced a heart of stone with a heart of flesh. Now, one thing that uh, comes to mind is we as Christians and soldiers throughout the world, and I, I know, well, Gary's going to mention it, but the, the similarities are that there's, there's really, it's, it's hard for me to find what's different. There's more similarities than there are differences. And one of those is uh, the oath that that you take when you enlist. And then that oath, you, you know, I state your name, do solemnly swear to uh, support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and, and uh, bear witness to the same that I swear to obey the orders of the President of the United States and the officers appointed over me by regulation, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, so help me God. That is in that oath, so help me God. How many times have, have, have we as Christians been overcome, been overwhelmed, dropped to our knees, help me God. I can't do this on my own, I need your help. There's no difference, there's no difference. The only thing that is different <clears throat> that I see between a soldier on the battlefield and a Christian in a lost and dying world are the weapons that we use. A soldier will look to, to overcome his enemy, bend him to his will, make him submissive by weapons and, and powers of, 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 of man. Whereas I see Candy going to a conference and maybe talking to a, a lady that doesn't necessarily understand what God has planned for her and that actually maybe even kind of kind of resents the fact that she's trying to speak truth into her. But that weapon of truth that she's sticking into that woman's ear eventually will not make her an enemy. It'll over, she'll be overcome at one point in time. That is the best way I see fit to, to, to destroy your enemy, is to love them. To heap those coals on their head, make them not your enemy anymore. And live together. Love one another. Love God. Love each other. So the, the veterans that are in here, can I get you guys to come on up? Yeah. 
Cameron, did you swear in? You did? Swore in. And yet your husband about coming up here and, and uh, enjoying the fruits of the brotherhood. I haven't looked at or in that spot yet, but I'm looking forward to. These are the reason, these guys up here, why, part of the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. Just a few minutes ago, I spoke about uh, God replacing hearts of stone with hearts of flesh. And I want you to tell them what you told Pastor John about your experiences in the room or what you're doing out there at that church right now. Well, uh, thanks, Tony. When I first went out to the church, it was the summer of 2015, I started working. Father, as you look down on, on this gathering that are here to, to bring glory to you and to worship you, I pray, Father, that it puts a smile on your face to look at these men and see the hearts that they have. Each and every one of them have the gift of service. That's what they that's what they do, that's what they do well. Father, I ask that you bless them. You bless their homes, you bless their family. You bless everything that they put their hand to. Everywhere they put their foot down is blessed simply because they carry the Spirit of Almighty God wherever they go with them. you bless those who bless them and continue Father to protect them and keep them in Jesus name God 
fight the enemy for, right? So then as we enter into worship, if you can, if you're able, I'd like to ask all you veterans to stay up here with us and fight the enemy spiritually as we all worship together for these people. Spiritually, we have a greater enemy than we do physically. And if these men fight the battle physically for us to live in peace, then I would like to challenge them and ask them today to fight the battle spiritually for all of us, for their families and their children. So I'd like to ask all that wants to to come on up as we enter into worship.
about what this Megan said, that at some point in time, every knee is going to bow. And then she made the statement, good or bad. So then I started to think about how every disease and everything that has been a result of the fall of man and we live on a fallen earth, every bit of sorrow, everything that is negative that the human being has to experience right now and the believer has to experience it as well because it rains on the just and the unjust and we do live in this fallen earth. But at some point in time, all of that will bend and bow its knee to the name of Jesus Christ the King. And although there are some things that we have to endure here and now, someday, as children of God and eternal beings, we will no longer have to experience any of it. Anything negative, any disease, broken relationships, death, none of these things God ever authored. He didn't author the sickness in that precious little girl. He didn't author the death of your loved one. It was never meant for a human being to have to grieve because of separation. That all happened at the fall of man. But then thanks be to God that loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus Christ to reverse that curse. And as we believe on the name of Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, as we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that Jesus Christ is the risen Son of God, then that curse that happened in the garden is reversed for us. And although in our humanity right now that we still live in this earth, that we feel it, it's sad to us, we grieve, separation is difficult, but one day we're not going to have to deal with any of it anymore. And in the meantime, we can call the name of Jesus Christ and we can find comfort through the power of his Holy Spirit that has set up kingdom right on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter, the guide, the one who gives us teaching and understanding. And that's what we need this morning. I think there are so many people in this room right now that need to have understanding and wisdom and comfort and we need to call on the name of Jesus as we sing and believe that he is who he says he is. And one day, like Megan said, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Jacob, let's sing that one more time. The name of Jesus.
Come around me, beautiful, beautiful gifts from heaven. guys grow up and start to take over. They're going to be blessed. They're going to be leaders. They're going to be powerful. In Jesus' name. So let an anointing settle on them. Already at this young age, let them be anointed for service. In Jesus' name. I love you guys. he did before the earth was formed. He spoke everything. Everything that we see, he spoke into creation. He spoke it and it came to be. Except for us. Man, he formed with his own hands and then he blew breath of life into him. I don't think that he would do that just so that we could suffer what we're suffering here. So Lord, we're going to come to you. And I'm going to pray peace, healing, and comfort for everybody on this list, their families and friends. 
anything that they're battling, they'll be able to see clarity in, and they will know that your hand is in it. In Jesus' name. Ushers, can I get you to come on up here? I just want to make a quick announcement while we're taking the offer. Next Saturday, we get the opportunity to build a float for the parade, the Christmas parade. So uh, we're going to meet out the Nick Cummings about 8.30, Saturday morning, whether he knows it or not. And uh, we're going to build a parade. We're going to build this parade float. So uh, if you're like me and you're not real sure where Nick lives, uh, I'm sure if you ask him, he'll let you know. But we're going to be there about 8.30, and we're going to build this float. And I believe that it'll be bigger and better than it was last year. Right? That's right. Phil Carter, where are you in the building, Phil Carter? Okay, Phil, thank you. When I got here this morning, Phil Carter was hanging these beautiful flags behind us. Isn't this beautiful? Phil, I just want you to know I appreciate your hard work because I know that wasn't easy. Thank you. that's here, what you allow us to do. Lord, I pray right now that the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit reveals your word in our lives, that it'll be something that'll make a difference. We're not just here to come because it's a habit or 
because we're expected to. Lord, we're here to allow your spirit to touch our lives, to have a divine touch that brings us into another level. So help that to happen to each and every one of us. Not just a few, but all in Jesus' name. Amen. God is a God of covenant, and He has made a covenant. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 4, and we have such trust through Christ toward God. Our trust through Christ toward God. Somebody I was talking to this morning, we were talking about trusting God. But our trust comes through Christ. It's because of Christ we have the ability to trust God with our lives, no matter what's going on. Through Jesus, we have the ability to trust God. Not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency comes from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the old covenant, which was the letter, but of the spirit. So the old covenant was the letter of the law. The new covenant is through the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. If the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which that glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? The old covenant was glorious through the letter, but its glory faded away. It fades away. The new covenant glory does not fade away. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what is made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away, the old covenant, was glorious, what remains, the new covenant, is more glorious. Paul is insisting that everything he does is not himself, it's God. And it's God's work, and he never says, this is what I've done. He's always saying, God has enabled me to do this. Now, this was a guy that had started out a pretty terrible life in, in, in the aspect of his drive to persecute Christianity. I mean, we would look at him and we'd say, oh, here's a guy that's persecuting the Christians and then God saves him. Now, look, he's a leader and he's touched by God and he's enabled. But he always remembers that it's not his strength, it's God's. It's not him, it's God. This is a guy that was so close to God that the sweat from his body healed people because it wasn't him. It was God. It's the same today. Paul never even conceived himself of being adequate. He never, ever tried to do anything in his own power. He was always relying on the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. The same thing we have available today there was an old covenant and there was a new covenant. Let me just tell you a little bit about covenant of where our thought will go when we think of covenant. A covenant in just the worldly way is different than a covenant in the divine. 
A covenant in a worldly way is two parties coming together and making an agreement. Equal parties, and both parties would have their needs or their wants uh, in this covenant that they would make together. And then they make a covenant, one with the other, and they promise to keep that covenant. The difference in a divine covenant is that God himself lays the covenant forward and gives us the power to either choose or reject it. There, there's really no negotiation. On our part, we have nothing to add to this covenant that God has given us to consider. This is the new covenant. God, through Jesus, has said, will you receive this covenant that I'm wanting to make with you? So we now have an arrangement with God that it can't be altered. It can't be added to. It's just receive it or don't receive it. It's a divine covenant. It's a very different thing than when we make a covenant with people and between one another, a business covenant. So this word that Paul's using for new is the same word that Jesus used for new. They were actually two words that were, that were used for new, and they used the one Hebrew word that meant new in point of time. And it also meant new in quality. So the word that Jesus and Paul both are using, it's not only new in a matter of time, which a, a baby is new, a newborn baby is new in a matter of time, but now this is not only a new covenant compared to the old covenant, as a matter of time, as a new baby, it's also greater in quality. It's above and beyond. So God now with the new covenant toward us is adding another dimension to our relationship with him that never was before the new covenant. The old covenant was based on a written document. It was laws of stone. The new covenant is based on the power of the life-giving spirit of God himself. There's a lot of difference between something written on a tablet and the very power of God that enters into you. A written document is something external. It's written, we read it, we internalize it by reading it, that written document. But the work of the Spirit is a matter of our heart. It changes our reaction to that covenant. You can obey a written code and not really like obeying it. You might be driving along like I do and you see a speed limit sign at 65 miles an hour and wish it was 85. You really don't like it, but you slow down because there's a consequence. It's the law. It's the rule. You can, you can not like the written code, but you can force yourself to obey it because of consequences. That written code is different in the spirit because now the spirit comes in and you change from what you feel you have to do to what is your true heart's desire. There's a big difference between being made to do something and having a desire to do something. The old covenant made you do something. The new covenant gives you the very desire to do it. Unfortunately, many of us still at times and maybe not all the time, but at times, we're living old covenant. We're making ourselves do the right thing, when truthfully, what we need to do is understand under the new covenant, under the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the desire to do the right thing will be there, not just our will strong enough to do the right thing. The old covenant was deadly. It was a legal relationship. You must keep that law. God was a judge. Man was a criminal. 
and you stood before the bar of judgment of Almighty God. So that old covenant was deadly in the fact that the relationship was judge and criminal between God and man. There was never any hope of keeping it because in our humanity we were incapable of keeping the rules and regulations and that's why God made a new covenant. Israel tried to obey the rules and regulations but they didn't really do a very good job of it and God saw that. So he sent his son Jesus and the frustration that led to death was suddenly changed into something different, something new, something different in quality. Not only in a period of time, not only because Jesus was a certain time, but that new covenant was new in quality because the old covenant could tell you what to do, but it couldn't help you do it. Do you see there's a huge difference in something that tells someone that tells you what to do or someone that comes over here and helps you to do it. You know people like that? I know people that are always good about telling me what to do, but when it comes time to do it, where are they? The old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant tell, told us what to do. Didn't make it wrong. So God made the new covenant, and with this covenant, he said, I'm, not even, I'm, I'm going to send you a helper to do what I've told you to do, the Holy Spirit. It changes our life. It gives us strength to do what God wants us to do, and more than that, the desire to do what God wants us to do. Now Moses came off of the mountain and the Bible says that he covered his face because of the glory of God. But that did not last. It happened for a time. And then the glory was off Moses. Now you would think if the glory of God came on him that he would live in that glory from that day forward, but he did not. He put a veil over his face so people wouldn't have to look at it. It evidently was so bright and yet it faded away. God's new covenant never allows the glory to fade out of our life. Well, how can that be? Because I have a choice. Because the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit will give you the ability to keep the glow and the power of the glory on yourself. And Satan is the master deceiver, and all he's trying to do is to steal that glory from you. But it's an eternal flame. It's not made to pass away. It's the new covenant. The old covenant was second best. The worst enemy of the best is the second best. The worst enemy of doing the best you can do is doing good enough. The old covenant was good enough. The old covenant was truth. The old covenant today is just as important as it was the day it's written, but there's something a whole lot better. Now we've got something that we have help with. We've got a new covenant that's better in quality. The religious people have always refused to enter into the best. They're always content with second best. They cling to the old. You know the people that refused to use chloroform were the church people when it was discovered? The uh, poems that were written by Wadsworth the religious people thought they were evil. When Wagner began to write his music, religious people were against it. Churches all over the world and individuals cling to the old. There's even a huge discussion among churches about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
So if, you, if you're walking and you are a believer and you've decided that, well, this baptism of the Holy Spirit is something I don't know much about. Maybe I'm a little afraid of it. I've never really been taught it. Then I'm not going to enter into that new covenant. That is what the new covenant is. Without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're walking in the old covenant and you don't have the power to do a very good job of it. You need that presence and power of the Holy Spirit in your life. We must be careful never to worship the stages of our experience. Even when you're when you're doing what you can do to get along with people, if somebody's a whole lot different than you are, you really kind of reject them, right? I mean, if somebody's a whole lot different than you are, you don't enjoy being with them. And yet, we're supposed to love everybody the same. There are stages in our life and in our spiritual life that we go through. If we, we, we really don't like somebody very well, so that's stage one. I could give you this example because I think it can make this more real to you. So you all have somebody you really don't like to be around that much, right? I mean, unless there's somebody here that's different than me, there's always somebody that's that really somebody. I mean, that just kind of gets under your skin kind of talk. so then you, you you come from this not liking to be around this person and so then you you baptized by the holy spirit the holy spirit starts to take control of your life and you you start to change what starts to happen to you you go from not liking this person at all to being able to tolerate them right so now I'm doing pretty good. The Holy Spirit's helping me. In my own power, I didn't like them. Now I can tolerate them. But then as you start to allow the Holy Spirit to take over and you start pushing yourself to the back, you start to celebrate the difference that that person is. That difference and that different person, now you celebrate their existence because you start to understand that this kingdom of God has got to be built by a whole lot of different people because if everybody are like you, nothing much would get done. Only what you can do. So if we're all digging in the same little hole, then we're not going to get a very big pond built, are we? Because only one person could be in that hole at a time. But you want everybody to be just like you. So now I want everybody to get in my hole. And dig with me. When, when there's a whole bunch of other things need to be going on, there needs to be somebody cutting the trees down. There needs to be somebody like Eric with a hoe that's digging out the roots. And there needs to be a whole lot of things going on or this hole's never going to get dug. But I don't like the tree trimmers. No, I don't really like the guy digging out the roots. I just like the guy with the shovel. <laughs> the kingdom of God is built by a variety of people with a whole lot of different talents and, and a whole lot of different opinions and, and a whole lot of different personalities. And I know that we can clash with people, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to start to tolerate people and then actually celebrate them. What was impossible in the flesh is possible in the spirit. We're not clinging to the old. We're working toward the new. This scripture goes on. And it talks about the veil. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. And then he makes this statement, unlike Moses. Well, I thought Moses was the greatest leader. The children of Israel and the whole, the, all the Jewish nation looked to Moses as the greatest man that ever lived. And he said, unlike Moses, because Moses put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were hardened for until this day that same veil remains unlifted. They have the veil on in reading the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. 
But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies in their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil's taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same thing from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. No fear. We're being transformed, not because of what we're doing, not because of what we've learned, not because of how strong your will is. We're being transformed by the Spirit of the Lord. It's not us. The King James in Exodus 34, 33 says that Moses put a veil over his face until he had finished speaking. But the correct translation of that Hebrew, as it is in the verse we just read, verse 13, says that Moses did this when he had finished speaking. So he, truthfully, he came down from the mountain and the glow was on him and everybody saw it. He, had, he, he talked about the law. He gave them what God had given him and then he put a veil on his face. And that veil on his face was not to cover the glory, the veil on his face was to hide the, the fact that the glory was leaving. It was so the people weren't discouraged. And in verse 13 of what I just read, it says that. It says that the children of Israel could not steadily look at the end of what was passing away. The veil hid the reality of what was passing away. Because everything in the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. And Jesus is the reason that the Holy Spirit is here and he lives in us. The slow fading of that glory is not what we live under. In the Old Covenant, it was. In the New Covenant, it is not. The Old Covenant was fading away. It was incomplete. It was partial. It wasn't complete. We start on a journey, and in that journey of Christianity, we understand the ways of the Lord through the Old Covenant. But as we start in this New Covenant, we start to move toward the destination that the Lord has prepared for us under this New Covenant with Him. A veil keeps you from seeing the real meaning. And there are reasons that people still wear the veil. There are a lot of reasons, as a matter of fact, and just a few spiritually veiled by prejudice. Not the prejudice for people, but the prejudice of your own views. I've got this view about how it should be, and if you don't agree with me, I'm going to do everything I can to beat my idea into you. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to destroy relationships when I do that. Do you understand that? Not everybody's going to think exactly like we do, and you're behind a veil when you're trying to make everybody support your views when the truth of God, it says, is made true to all people, and we can all understand. We can be veiled by wishful thinking. We just find what we want to find or we wish to find something in the scripture i've seen people actually take the bible and try to prove their idea and just take little pieces of it because they want people to see what they're seeing and they're neglecting the whole picture we can be veiled by fragmentary thinking, like just fragments. We don't take the Bible as a whole. We'll pull out this little scripture and this little scripture, and we'll build our own little private theology around these little things, and suddenly we're just choosing these certain texts, and we're wearing a veil. It comes from disobedience. We can have a blindness which isn't actually moral. It's more like an intellectual blindness that we persist in, in this thing that I'm just talking about how it's got to be our way and, 
how we're not agreeing with anything anybody else is saying and we've got all the truth and nobody else has anything and it just comes along and then pretty soon we become less and less capable of seeing the Lord because the veil has blinded us now. The unteachable spirit that has it all figured out, the people have to see it their way, our way or the highway. We can only see the glory of God when our veil's off. I've heard a lot of people talk about masks and what we hide behind and what we tend to want to do. These, these are just all human things. It's natural for you to want people to be like you. It's natural for you to want people to believe what you believe. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, we suddenly realize that, hey, it's Jesus' image that I'm wanting to portray. It's not my ideas. It's not the way I want it to be. It's the, what Jesus said. It's what Jesus was. The very Spirit of God is in me, and he's living through me. The Lord is a spirit. The work of the Spirit, the work of the risen Lord, it's all one and the same. Jesus rose from the dead, conquered death. Now we have eternal life, and it's all the work of the Spirit. And that Spirit's the same Spirit that comes into you and me. Where the Spirit is, there is liberty. As long as our obedience to God's conditioned by obedience to a code of laws, we're an unwilling slave. If you're still living under the old covenant, you're a slave, not a servant. We're in a position to have the Holy Spirit in our heart. And the only slave we can be a slave to is a slave to the kingdom system. And the kingdom system is based on love and whosoever will. And the power of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God is love and acceptance. And I know I hammer on this a lot, but the truth of it is we have to be a light, first of all, to this community and then to our region and then to the world. We have to be something that's really Holy Spirit anointed, full of the presence and power of God. And we can't do this in the flesh. We have to do it by allowing God's presence as Paul. It was never his, his, his power. It was never his thing. It was always God working through him. Now, you do realize you are a tool. Your tool so God needs a tool to work through, Gary. He needs you to work through. If you, if you won't allow that, he'll work through somebody else. So I hear some people, anytime they even get a compliment, oh, that they're so unworthy. and they're, That's false humility. You're worthy. Jesus died for you. You're a big deal. You're not a worm of the dust. You can't influence anybody by being a worm. God doesn't want a bunch of worms. Matt, God wants some people of influence that can rise up and love people that are unlovable and do things that are only done through the, prince, the power of the Prince of Peace and Almighty God. Only through his power can we accomplish what we need to accomplish. Anything else that we can just do in the flesh, anybody can do it. We need to be a body of believers that do things through the power of the Spirit and watch what will happen. It will be so far above and beyond what we could ever imagine and think. But some of us are stuck in what we believe. We're stuck in our way of thinking, and we're going to try to make people think like we think. And maybe that's okay, what you're thinking. Maybe it works for you. But give somebody else a little slack. Because God has spoken through a donkey. And he might speak through somebody you think's a donkey. We're not strangers. We're sojourners. That means we're walking together.
We're all walking the same path. We're all trying to get to the same place. And we don't just tolerate one another. When you think you've arrived because you can tolerate somebody, arrive when you can celebrate that person instead of tolerating them. Take off the veil. The glory of God is living in you, and people need to see the glory of God. And anything that's veiling that from everyone else seeing it is a hindrance to the kingdom. It's a hindrance to the building of the kingdom because you are chosen. You are God's people, and he had chosen to put his spirit and his power in you. And we believe it, and we go forward, and we see things that only the people of faith can see because it's not what we see. It's what we believe. And through that belief, we eventually see the hand of God. Get the veil off. Stand with me. Lord, we need to be set free. The only kingdom we need to serve is your kingdom, kingdom of love, kingdom that is the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit working through us. Sometimes we get these ideas of how it should be. Lord, forgive us. But we don't even know how to worship unless you guide us into worship. Unless we're guided by the Holy Spirit, we don't even know what worship is supposed to be like. We can sing and we can preach and we can pray and we can shout and we can laugh and we can cry. But unless you're guiding it into us, it's just a bunch of emotion. Unless your presence and your power is in the middle of it, it really doesn't make any difference in the kingdom. It's a good time and we all leave and face the same old problems that we faced last week and fall to the same old stuff and end up feeling the same way and turn around and do it all over. The glory of the power of the Holy Spirit that's in us does not fade. It's God himself. Help us, Lord, to understand that. Help us, Lord, to understand that that power and presence of the Holy Spirit is seen by everybody that we come in contact with. And when we put on a veil, we hide it. And there are lives hanging in the balance. There are lives that need to be changed. And the only thing that's going to change them is the power of the Spirit of God. We are not going to change them. We're going to allow you, God, to flow through us, and it'll happen. So we present ourselves here this morning as vessels for the presence for the Holy Spirit. Vessels to allow your presence to shine through us. Vessels that are taking off any kind of veil that's hiding your glory. Whether we think we know it all, whether we think it has to be our way, whether we look down on some people and up on some other people, whether we're prejudiced, whether we're worldly, all these veils that hide your glory, Lord, let them be removed today. And it's only your presence of power, Lord, that can do that. We could choose that, and you'll do it. We'll choose, you'll do it. You're not just going to tell us what to do. You're going to enable us to do it because you're, going, you're our helper. You're our paraclete. The Holy Spirit is our helper, leads us, guides us into all truth, and helps us to do it. So, Lord, help us this morning to understand that the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit has to absorb our very being. 
and it has to take over for us to be able to do what I'm praying about right now. If you feel right now there's a need in your life to allow the presence of the power of the Spirit to take over, whether you feel that you've done this before and right now you're weak, whether you feel like it just isn't happening in your life, you need the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. You need to be absorbed by this divine touch that comes only from God himself. You're tired of doing it in your strength. You're tired of facing the same old thing week after week month after month, year after year. There are things in your life that you need to lay down. There are veils you need to take off. I'm asking you to come forward and let's lay those veils down here at the feet of the Lord and let's get on with it. In Jesus' name, that we could be the light of the world that we're called to be. That when people look at us, they're not seeing a veil, they're seeing the glory. What in your life is veiling the glory and the presence? Think about it. What am I doing? What am I hanging on to? The altar's open. What in your life do you need to lay down? What's holding you back? What is it? What's the reoccurring thing? What sets you off? What gets under your skin? Or what person? Or what thing? lot of you right now the Lord's speaking to you and I urge you I urge you as we've celebrated Veterans Day today I urge you in Jesus name to let the power of the Spirit remove a veil that has veiled you that's held you back from being the best you could be. I'm going to wait just one more minute. I just think there's a whole lot more folks here that know exactly in their life what their veil is that needs to be removed. I know it's kind of, it's not this feel-good thing, that, but it's something that just keeps tearing you down. You get on top for a while and then just keep tearing you down. It's a veil in your life. Under this new covenant, there's a glory that can be seen.